I think about work because the God who worked to create this world and the God who created the very concept of work and the God who created the first worker didn't even let life get started without instructing him on how to maintain balance in life. The Bible says the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts and by the seventh day God completed his work which he had done and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because in it he rested from all his work which God created and made. So God didn't even let life get started without instructing us on how to maintain balance in our life. The world offers many so-called remedies to the problem of stress but the truth is most of them don't work. The world offers so many so-called experts on stress management but the truth is there is only one great physician who can give us the comfort and stress and the wisdom that we need to handle stress. And the world offers many so-called solutions from the tensions and the burdens that push us down and pull us apart. But the truth is, there is only one Prince of Peace and His name is Jesus who can soothe our jangled nerves and save our troubled souls. And I read a study about how it impacts people because of many experiences and crippling pressure-like situations. And they have a stress point ratio. And they say the death of, the, uh, of a spouse carries with it 100 stress points. Number two, they said divorce carries with it 73 stress points. Number three, they said marital separation carries with it 65 stress points. Number four, it said death of a close family member took 63 stress points. Detention in jail or other institutions like what happened to Aryan, 63 stress points. Major personal surgery or illness, 63 stress points. Marriage. 50 stress points, loss of a job, 47 stress points, retirement from work, 45 stress points, and on and on the list goes. It could be financial problems, it could be critical changes in work hours and conditions, it could be change of residence, change in school. All of these things play a significant role in bringing about the kind of stress upon our lives that weakens our resistance and sets the stage for us to become a victim of some major physical or emotional illness and over the years I have noticed that people who are trying to deal with stress and this morning we are talking on the subject how to handle the mess of stress I have noticed broadly speaking people try to deal with their stress in three different ways number one the first philosophy is escape the stress number two they say endure the stress and number three they say elevate the stress the three philosophies of handling stress. Let's look at one of them. The first says escape the stress because they say stress is bad. And these people say avoid it at all costs. They say get away. They say run away. They say fly away. They say take a pill to ease your nerves. They say take a drink to drown your sorrows. They say take a shot to kill the pain. Get drunk, get drugs, sleep a lot. Do whatever you have to do to escape the stress. That's what this first school of thought says. And it's not a good answer to the problem of stress but it is a very popular one these days you go and turn on your TV and you look at the commercials and notice how many of them advocate this escape philosophy they brag about it and they say just the right drink will do just the right pill will do just the right place will do and just the right trip will do so to solve all your problems get away from everything now please don't misunderstand me I know that there are times when it's appropriate and helpful to take medicine or to go on vacation or retreat or get away from things in your life but that's not what the Bible talks about in the way we handle the mess of stress I'm not talking about the escapism approach in life because it is rooted in a very mistaken notion the overriding task in life they say is to escape from the stress to run away hide from the problems run away and hide from the pressures run away and hide from the demands and challenges of life so there is one way of handling stress they say is to escape the stress number two they say endure the stress you know there was an old dirt roadway out in the country with a sign which said be real careful which ruts you get into because you'll be in them for the next 20 miles some people get in the rut of seeing life as nothing more than just coping 
nothing more than just enduring nothing more than just surviving nothing more than just sticking it out but does that line up with what the bible says because you see when you look at the bible the way you look at life is not just an enduring journey it is god's wonderful gift to us amen that even with all the stress even with all the problems even with all the pressure even with all the challenges god still has a way to make his children enjoy life a meaningful abundant creative productive and joyful life hallelujah you see the point is clear with all the stress that you're going through with all the pressure that you're going through with all those challenges that you're going through with all those people that you have to run into every day let me tell you this the truth is there are still doxologies that we can sing hallelujah there are still things that we can be grateful for hallelujah and there are still things and many blessings that we can count the point is clear life is just more than a grueling endurance test Life is more than a survival game and life is more than a coping competition. So you see, it's not enough just to escape the stress. It's not enough to endure the stress. There's another way, another philosophy they teach. They say, elevate the stress. What do they mean by that? They say, do something positive with the stress in your life. They say, you can bring it to God and God will give you the strength to turn your problems into opportunities. And they say, let it spur you into action. Let the stress do something good for the cause of Christ. And so they say, redeem the stress. Use the stress as a creative service for God. Now that's one way of looking at it. But let me tell you this. Our calling as Christians need not be to escape the stress. Our calling as Christians need not be to endure the stress but a calling as Christians may be to elevate the stress and that is why this morning I have only one passage in my Bible about a man who went through a stressful situation and his name was Moses and if you would turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 18 let's all read from verse 13 all the way to 27 all right we can read this all together on the count of one two and three and so it was on the next day that Moses sat to judge the people and the people stood before Moses from morning until evening so when Moses' father-in-law saw all that he did for the people he said what is this thing that you are doing for the people why do you alone sit and all the people stand before you from morning until evening and Moses said to his father-in-law because the people come to me to inquire of God when they have a difficulty they come to me and I judge between one another and I make known the statutes of God and his laws so Moses' father-in-law said to him the thing that you do is not good both you and these people who are with you will surely wear yourselves out for this thing is too much for you you are not able to perform it by yourself listen now to my voice i will give you counsel and god will be with you stand before god for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to god and you shall teach from the statutes and the laws and show them the way in which they must walk and work they must do moreover you shall select from all the people able men such as fear God men of truth hating covetousness and place such over them to be rulers of thousands rulers of hundreds rulers of fifties and rulers of tens and let them judge the people at all times then it will be that every great matter they shall bring to you but every small matter they them shall, uh, themselves shall judge so it will be easier for you for they will bear the burden with you if you do this thing and God so commands you then you will be able to endure and all these people will also go to their place in peace and Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said and Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people rulers of thousands rulers of hundreds fifties and tens so they judged the people at all times the hard cases they brought to Moses but they judged every small case themselves most of us have read the Psalm 23 that's one of the most famous psalms in the Bible. After Psalm 1, that's the second psalm I had to memorize. That my father made me memorize. It's one of the most well-known passages in the Bible. It is a psalm that gives rest. It's a psalm that gives refreshment. It's a psalm that brings revival and has brought changes to untold millions around the world. But someone wrote another version of psalm, a very funny version of this psalm that I believe is a great reflection, not in the time David lived, but the time that you and I live. This is what it says. The, instead of the Lord is my shepherd, it says the clock is my dictator. I shall not rest. It makes me lie down only when exhausted. It leads me to deep depression. It hounds my soul. 
It leads me in circles of frenzy for activity's sake. Even though I run frantically from task to task, I will never get it all done for my ideal is with me. Deadlines and my need for approval, they drive me. They demand performance from me beyond the limits of my schedule. They anoint my head with migraines. My in-basket overflows. Surely fatigue and time pressure shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the bonds of frustration forever. Stress has become a way of life. It is the rule rather than the exception. There is no question that we are all living in a mess of stress. Now, where does the word stress come from? The word stress comes from a Latin word that means to be drawn tight. The word stress comes from the Latin word which means to be drawn tight. And one of the most popular phrases used to describe us today is to be, I'm stressed out. I'm stressed out. I know a lot of people who are all stressed up and they have no place to go. Because stress is now known to be a leading cause of heart disease and cancer. It causes depression and can lead to migraine, headaches, hypertension, chest pains, ulcers, gastritis and heartburn. Well, stress was no stranger to a man named Moses in the Bible. And Moses, as we are going to discover today, was the first stressed out person in the Bible. He was a classic case of burnout. And in him, we learn exactly how to deal with the mess of stress. Everybody say, mess of stress. Lovely. Mess of stress. So the first key I want to leave with you on how you can handle stress, you can put it down in your notes, is if you want to handle stress strategically, define your limits. Define your limits. You look at verses 13 through 18, what Moses says, he had no limits. Because people would just come to him by the thousands. They, any difficulty, they will come. Any problem, they will come. Any question, they will come. Anything. This guy was handling thousands of people. He never knew how to define his limits. You see, stress is basically the gap between your ought to's and your can't do's. Stress is the gap between your ought to's and your can't do's. And when your can do can't keep up with your want to, frustration, tension and stress sets in. And that was the problem with this man named Moses in the Bible. And so it was the next day, as Moses went to sit to judge the people, the people stood before Moses from morning until evening. And Moses was having to learn that even though he was this great man, he could not do everything. You cannot do everything. You know, Dirty Harry, the name was right when he said, a wise man knows his limitations. There are limits to what any person can do. And a wise person must define those limits. Now Moses was not lazy. Don't get it wrong. He was not getting to the office at the crack of dawn. And he was not leaving until the close of dusk. He was working six days a week with no vacations, no time off. He was the first workaholic in recorded history in the Bible. And his fuel tank was empty. There's an old Greek motto that says, You will break the bow if you always keep it bent. There is nothing I believe that perhaps causes more stress than simply trying to overload the load that you already carry. And in the 19th century, the maritime industry was having a difficult time with recorded ships sinking in heavy seas. In 1880, Samuel Plimsoll, the United Kingdom, tackled this problem successfully. He submitted a bill in the parliament insisting that a line be drawn outside the hull of all British ships. When the ships were loaded with freight and reached the level where the line hit the water, the ships were not allowed to load any more freight. That marking on a ship's hull became known as the Plimsoll Line. Now the truth is, we all have Plimsoll Lines. We all have limits. Have you ever noticed when you get behind a huge tractor trailer that is carrying a lot of cargo or freight, there's a sign that tells the load limit that the truck can carry. Well, you can be sure if those gigantic trucks and those gigantic engines and ships have load limits, what about your load limits? And this was Moses' problem. Now on the outside, he looked very impressive. 
he was eating on the run he was ripping from one end of the camp to the other he was planning appointments he was meeting deadlines he was seeing people but on the inside he was dying on the vine he had a wise father-in-law who recognized it and Moses was stressed out his nerves frayed little sleep bags under his eyes he was just looking for a place to sit down so he could have a complete breakdown he was burning the candle as they say at both ends and his wax was almost gone and one day his father-in-law came to him and said you are wearing yourself out and the Hebrew word for wearing out literally means to become old that's what it means in Hebrew and Moses was growing old much and well before his time did you know that that can be a dangerous thing in our life when we don't learn how to define our limits we don't learn how to set our limits and thank God for Moses' father-in-law who identified this man who was burnt out, stressed out, wearing himself out that he came and spoke to him in the verses 13 through 18 helped him understand the importance of defining his limits setting his limits do you know that a typical concert piano has over 240 strings that when tuned and tightened create a pull of 40,000 LBS on the frame now without that tension there can be no beautiful music but if those strings are drawn too tight and you exert too much pressure it will crack and that piano will, will destroy its sound what is true of a concert piano is also true about you if you get overloaded you will knock yourself out much before your time and you know what will happen that premature thing will rob the music out of your life and that is why let this message come clear and let this message come strong in your life that if you've not defined your limits in your life then you're probably going to do it this Sunday morning so number one define your limits set your limits number two look at verses 19 and 20 of the same chapter he says listen now to my voice i give you counsel god will be with you stand before god for the people so that you may bring the difficulties to god and you shall teach them statutes and laws and show them the way in which they must walk and the work they must do the second key is everything that happens in your life take it to god and pray that's what he says stand before god what does it mean take it to god and pray everything to god and pray so the first piece of advice was to set the limits define your limits limits with your family limits with your work place limits with your friendships your social circles limits with you know people that you work with professionally whatever it may be number two is take everything to God in prayer the best thing you can do to handle the mess of stress is to begin every day with Jesus that's the best thing. Psalm 46 10 says be still and know that I am God we know that God sometimes uses stress to force you to have quiet time with Him. It's happened to me. He used stressful situations to force me. It was getting too busy with my life activities. There may be some things that you cannot handle, but there is nothing that you and God cannot handle. There may be some things that you cannot handle, but there is nothing that you and God cannot handle. You just have to make sure it's the things that God wants you to handle. That's the most important. Let me tell you a couple of things. Whenever you come to God in the morning, first thing you must do is celebrate His presence. Because He's our refuge and strength. A very present help in trouble. The trouble that you're going through and that is causing stress in your life, pressure in your life, come to God and celebrate His presence. But let me tell you this. Because God has a way. Even though you feel between the rock and a hard place God has a way of being your refuge and your strength even in the middle of that the second thing you must do is once you celebrate his presence start appropriating his power that's powerful because you cannot meet stress on a day-to-day -day basis on your strength you gotta meet stress with the strength that comes from the Holy Spirit because stress will sap your strength stress will sap your strength but his strength will sap your stress. You know, there are two ways of handling pressure. And I believe that it is getting up in the morning, first thing, before you do anything else, before you check your phone for notifications, check your feeds. First thing you gotta do, celebrate his presence. Second thing, appropriate his power. Hallelujah. When you can do that, where you consistently take everything to God in prayer, you will begin to see a very stress-free life become more regular 
something that you experience every day of your life. Number three, look at verse 21 and 22. He gives him advice. He says, select from all the people. Then he goes on to say what he says in those two verses and let them do their work. The third key, number one, is define your limits. Number two, learn to take everything to Jesus in prayer. Because you may not be able to handle something, but you and him can handle anything. And don't face stress head on with your strength. Get his strength and then face those stressful situations. Number three, learn to share your Lord. Learn to share your Lord. We don't like doing that. Get others involved. That's the advice that his father-in-law gives Moses. Get others involved so they can help share the Lord. Because when it comes to doing heavy work, two hands are better than one. But let me say, six hands are better than two. Think about that statement. Two hands are better than one and six hands are better than two. So you see, the size of the work is never a problem as long as there is the sharing of work. So keep this in your mind. The size of the work will never be a problem as long as you know how to share your work. And one of the greatest leadership lessons they will teach you is delegate to others what others can do so you can focus on the things that only you can do. Delegate to others what they can do so you can focus on things that only you can do because nobody is indispensable but everybody is important. It's an incredible statement. So look for ways that you can share load with others. Not only that they might get under the burden of work, but also that they might enjoy the blessing of that work. That's key number three. Number one, define your limits. Number two, get into this habit where you take everything to God in prayer. You get His strength and you face those stressful situations in life. And number three, like I said, learn to share your load. Learn to share your load. Learn to delegate. Learn to invite people on the journey. Learn to invite people on the path that God has asked you to carve. And I believe that God is going to definitely enable you to enjoy the work that He has given you. And lastly, number 23, verse number 23. Look at what He says there in verse number 23. If you do this thing and God so commands you, then you will be able to endure and all these people will also go to their place. If you do this one thing, the fourth key I want to leave with you is learn to simplify your life. Learn to simplify your life. That's an incredible statement. What happens when you simplify your life? Look at what happened to Moses' life. When he simplified his life, he was beginning to handle that mess that he was going through. That mess of stress. And you know what happens when you simplify your life? You live longer. You know what happens when you simplify your life? You work smarter. You know what happens when you simplify life? Everybody is more happy. And nobody is more exhausted and all that is needed to get done will be done. Let me say a word about burnout. I believe burnout is totally out of the will of God for your life. And I don't believe we ought to burn. On the other hand, I believe we ought to get into a place where we last out. Alright? So let's replace everybody burnout with last out. Alright? You can't replace burnout with more workout. You got to replace burnout with a different way of looking at work. And the problem is we crowd the calendar and we clutter our lives with so many things that our hard drive just shuts down and we can't function. And there was a housewife who went to a doctor and said, what's wrong? She said, I feel run down. And after he examined her, he said, lady, you're not run down. You're too wound up. There's a difference between being run down and being wound up and exactly what happens when we try to do too much. When we try to do too much, we wound up. As I bring this to a close, animal trainers carry a stool with them. Anybody gone to the circus? You know why animal trainers carry a stool with them when they go into a cage of lions? And they will have a whip and most of them will have a pistol. But invariably, what they usually use is a stool. And they can pretty much mesmerize that lion and make that lion do what they want it to do. It's the most important tool of the trainer, the stool. If you ever notice, he holds the stool by the back and thrusts the legs toward the face of the wild animal. Now why is this so effective? Because that lion will try to focus on all the four legs at once. 
and in the attempt to focus on all the four legs at once a kind of paralysis overwhelms him and he will become tame weak and disabled because his attention is fragmented so are you telling me that the great moses the greatest deliverer in the bible could handle all that he could handle no he didn't he broke down he was almost on the verge of a burnout but he learned the importance of number 1 defining the limits number 2 taking everything to god in prayer number 3 sharing the workload and number 4 learning to simplify his life